I guess I feel like community is a dream from my childhood that I'm still searching for. It started before I was born and my parents were both uh, pre-kids working in Chicago and they heard this professor who came through town and he started talking about Christian community and he and this group of people were going to move to western Pennsylvania and they were going to buy land, buy houses, raise their kids together and create this Christian community. It didn't turn out the way that they anticipated, I don't think, but there were all these people who were living in the same county there in western PA and they bought land and they were big into raising their own animals and making their own food, being self-sustainable and a lot of them went to the same church and so we had People from the suburbs in Chicago, we had uh, first generation immigrants from Holland, my parents, who had been sort of Christian hippies searching for something. And this mix mash of people all came together. Uh, and I think I've continued to search for that still to this day. The crazy thing is that I've had the same conversation with friends, people I grew up with, live all over the country, actually all over the world, and they feel the same. We didn't know it at the time we were kids, but there was something unique that happened in those hills of Pennsylvania. And all of us, I think, are still chasing. It was 2005 and I'd been having back pains. And my doctor thought that I had kidney stones and so he had me on a full dose of Vicodin. It helped at first, but didn't solve the problem. And I remember crazy things. I remember standing in the lobby of the church, holding my bag like this and telling Pastor Denny, I just picked up a speaker or something heavy, sort of strained my back. And the Vicodin's then not working. I'm having these vivid dreams. I still remember these man-sized lobsters, bright red, and I'm swimming in the ocean as fast as I can. And I can actually feel the claws of these lobsters pinching me, my toes, as I try to swim faster and faster and I wake up in a sweat. Finally, full dose of Vicodin and it's still not taking away the pain and my doctor says, I'm gonna let you leave this office if you promise me you go right to the ER because something's wrong. I said, okay, so I drove to the ER and x-rays, tests, all that kind of stuff. The doctor walks in and he says, I'm sorry, this is not the part of my job that I like, but you have cancer. And when you're turning 30 years old, the last thing you think the doctor is going to say is cancer. Uh, we were crushed, shattered. We called our parents, we called uh, Pastor Denny and friends at the church. Um, we're just trying to figure out what's next. and. Uh, oncologist on call comes in and says we can we're gonna work through this we've got some options we need to do some tests do a biopsy we can do this while you're in the hospital instantly it seemed like the word went out and people started calling our phone and Sarah's trying to you know handle all these calls people started stopping by the hospital Tom Clooney he attends our church and he knew a surgeon Jeff Justice and he contacted him immediately and they were in touch with us. And so even before we had the surgery scheduled, we had a, a doctor and a whole surgical team. And uh, yeah, from the beginning, suddenly people were surrounding us. And even when it was a pretty serious situation, um, we went, ended up getting sent to IU Medical Center. And um, the way that they measure cancer is through um, hormones, um, HCG, if anyone's familiar with that, uh, when a woman is pregnant and they pee on a stick, that's what they're measuring, HCG. And guys usually have like three to five HCG. I was in the thousands. I was halfway pregnant. And so we went to IU Med down in Indianapolis and the doctor said, we can handle this. 85% cure rate for your situation because you're stage three, but the way this cancer works, the cancer will be in your lungs inside a week, it'll be inside your brain inside a month, and then you'll be dead. We need to start chemo today. Okay, so we started chemo. And that week we had people visiting us down in Indianapolis. Came back, and I remember weeks where I couldn't get off the 
sofa. I was so weak, I wanted to get up and get a cup of water, and I didn't know if I could make it across the, across the living room. Dave, a friend from the church, drove me to chemo every single day, picked me up. People brought us meals, and when I couldn't eat what they were bringing, they brought us gift cards, and they mowed our lawn uh, for weeks, months, actually. Um, on and on and on, they just surrounded us. And suddenly, this dream that I've been chasing of community, I started to experience that around us as people rallied around us and with family and friends out of state, our church became our family. It was interesting, at that point in time, I'd had sort of an itchy feeling, like I felt like I need to be doing something else. Um, I think it was because I'd been living my life in four-year increments, four years of middle school, four years of high school, four years of college, three and a half years of my first job, and then I was at the church, and this was about five years in. And I'd been looking at some different job postings and wondering what was the next step. And <laughs> there's nothing like cancer to take away that feeling. <laughs> and we realized that this is where God wanted us. And as long as he wants us here, this is where we're going to stay. You don't just walk away from that. We had two kids, and uh, my son Silas was six months old. And beautiful little boy, he had the sweetest temper, curly hair, blue eyes. But at six months, we knew something was up. The doctor said, he's not meeting his milestones. He wasn't able to hold his head up. Even when he sat, he was sort of wobbly. And we figured maybe just slow, you know, we just need to work with him harder. And so Sarah was really working with him to help him stand up and do all those kinds of things. Um, so we knew he wasn't hitting his milestones. We figured that we just need to work with him a little bit more. So Sarah was really working with him to sit up and to be able to do high eye. <laughs> Sarah was working with him to do eye-hand coordination so he could pick things up and it still wasn't getting any better, actually it was getting worse. At nine months the doctor said, I think something's, something's wrong and we need to do a brain MRI. And it was August, we were planning on moving and I remember the day distinctly because the doctor called and said we need to, we need to meet tomorrow. And we said, well, tomorrow we're supposed to be closing on our new house. He said, no, I think we need to meet. Can we somehow fit this appointment in? So we said, okay, we've got an hour. We will go and we'll meet with you, and then we'll go sign papers. And we went into the doctor's office, and he said, I have hardly ever seen this, but this is a textbook case for something called Lay's disease. Basically, it's death of brain cells, and it's a mitochondrial disorder, so he doesn't have enough energy coming from his mitochondria, and because of that, cells in his brain are dying, and it's, it's not a good diagnosis. And again, the world sort of caved in around us. Suddenly the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, make a lot more sense, because it felt that way. I knew it wasn't true, but it felt that way. Crazy thing was, we went to sign papers for our new house, and our realtor attends our church. She prayed with us. The lady who was helping us with mortgage documents attends our church. She prayed with us all on the same day. From that moment on, people just surrounded us. We had ladies, a team of ladies. They were Team Silas, and they would come and watch Silas in my office during church so Sarah could attend services. Uh, we had people who would come and babysit our kids so Sarah and I could go out on dates and they would come and be trained and figure out what was going on so that if Silas had seizures, which he had daily, they would know how to handle it. We started going to different hospitals, medical treatment, experimental treatments. People would give us gas cards. They would, money would just show up in my mailbox and people would just be there day after day. There were times where a couple times, Sarah would call and Silas's seizures were getting worse in the middle of the day and I would 
tell Pastor Denny, I got to go. And he'd say, leave, leave now. And I literally just walked out of my job. And we would travel to Indy, to Riley. We traveled to Cleveland Clinic. We did all kinds of experimental treatments. And, and none of it worked. We were able to slow down the progression of the disease, but we knew we were fighting a losing battle. So when he was one, almost two, he got an ear infection and we had to go through two rounds of antibiotic, but that took care of it. We saw some regression because of that, but he came out of it. The next winter, the same thing happened. He got another ear infection and the antibiotic didn't work. We knew something was wrong, Sarah especially. She was with him all the time and we took him to the doctor, his pediatrician here in Fort Wayne, four times that week. And they said, no, we can't find anything wrong with him. But we knew the system wasn't right. He was sluggish. He was sleeping a lot. Um, he just wasn't himself, even though he wasn't normally able to do a lot. By that point, he'd regressed to the point where he couldn't hold toys in his hands. He couldn't hold his head up. It would just sort of flop around. Um, he couldn't eat because he'd aspirate, and so food was all fed through a G-tube in his stomach. But still, something wasn't right. And we decided that we were going to take him to Riley the next day because any time we had taken him to the ER, to doctors here in town, um, not only do we have to inform them about Silas's condition, we also had to tell them what not to give him because there were certain drugs that would bring on dramatic regression or could be even fatal, and they were just unaware of it. So. We were checking him. We checked him five times that night. And then at 6 a.m., um, I had gotten up a little early and was getting out of the shower, was shaving, had a towel around my waist. Sarah came in and said his respiration rates dropped. Something's not right. So I went in, and we could tell just a uh, uh, really shallow breathing. And I said, babe, call 911. And she ran to call. And one, about a, it had to be a minute, two minutes after she left, he stopped breathing. And I grabbed him off the bed and I put him on the floor. And I was shaking him, saying, buddy, buddy, come on, buddy, Silas. And uh, I tried to do CPR, um, but he was gone. So they show up. The police officer was there in minutes. She took over with CPR. Ambulance came. They took him away. Chaos. And we have neighbors who are coming across the street. This is the house that we had bought the day that Silas was diagnosed. They walked right in. The policemen are trying to hold them back. And I said, it's OK, they're neighbors. Because they've been with us the whole time. And they said, how can we help? And I said, I need someone to take Eliana to Sarah's sister. And we've been cooking an egg casserole for her teacher at school. I said, someone's supposed to take this to school. And I don't know what else to do. And they said, don't worry about it. We'll do we got it covered. And we went to the ER. They were working on him as I walked into the ER. But he was gone already pronounced him dead at 7.02 a.m. Instantly, there were people there. Dan, Pastor Danny, Bob. They just surrounded us. I've never experienced anything like that. Like I said before, you don't walk away from that. This isn't just a job. These are friends and family. I realize this is what the church is supposed to be. This is what we're supposed to do. We show up. A lot of the people don't. We show up. <laughs>